This week, we welcome the brilliant Helen Joyce, author of Trans When Ideology Meets Reality. She's now the Director of Advocacy for Sex Matters, a human rights organization that campaigns for sex-based rights. We have created a social movement out of an obvious crazy delusion. And the consequence is that the craziness is everywhere because we've embedded it everywhere. Like HR departments are saying crazy things, governments are saying crazy things, doctors are saying crazy things, charities, NGOs, you know, sporting bodies. And and the funny thing about this one, well, it's not funny at all, it's horrific, is it breaks things in exactly the place where they're meant to work. So Mm. if you are a women's rights organisation and you decide that men can be women, It doesn't just break you as in you go and do some random other stuff or you become useless. You actually become a men's rights organization. Right. You turn through 180 degrees and you work back against your actual founding principles. And and this works for all of them. Like, you know, anti-censorship organizations become censorship organizations. Gay rights organizations become horrific, rapey, disgusting organizations trying to push heterosexual men on lesbians and to try to sterilize gay kids. This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fettesee. I'm Bridget Fettesee, and you are welcome. (laughs) You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback, and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Fetacy.com. You'll get access to behind-the-scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Fetacy.com. All right. I am with the great Helen Joyce, everybody. Welcome to Walk-Ins. Welcome. Oh, thank you for having me on. I feel like it's so overdue and I'm actually grateful that we have, there's been time in between when I first got your book and now, because my biggest question to you, you wrote this book trans in 2021, it came out, correct? My first question, yeah, my, my first question, I have many questions, but my first question is what has changed since you wrote that book? So I guess you mean in the culture at large. Yeah, I I mean, what do you see in the trends? What did you do? You feel like you what surprised you? Perhaps what's um, something you maybe predicted? Is it is it going as you kind of foresaw? So I think for the first year, yes, it did. So I made some predictions uh, in the book. Um, And there were also some stories that I had to leave aside because they weren't finished. Mm -hmm. You know, there were court cases that were open or whatever. And then when the paperback came out, which was sort of, I think, roughly a year later, I did a new forward and afterward. And in the forward, I talked about what it had been like, you know, in the time since for me. And then in the afterward, I um, caught up on some of the stories. And, you know, I'd like to have called that epilogue, you know, I was right about everything. (laughs) (laughs) So, for example, um, I predicted that uh, the trans sports issue would become huge because of the Olympics that was delayed during the pandemic. And then, you know, I I didn't predict the existence of specifically Leah Thomas, but I thought a Leah Thomas-like character would come along and that proved to be true. Um, I predicted that there would be no turning back and only worsening in the um, gender medicine in kids' gender clinics. And that was true beyond my wildest fears with the horrific, horrific guidance that came out from WPATH, which is the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. And I think that I predicted that there would just be much greater awareness of it through um, legal actions for employment and I finished off some of the employment cases that were still open. Mm-hmm. And then another year has gone by since then. And I think in some ways, I think the I would I you know, I wouldn't have predicted how fast things were moving in the States. I was very worried that, and I still am worried that you're going to end up being um American exceptionalism on this, like on everything else, mm-hmm. like guns and healthcare and um you know, what else, abortion law and things. Like you just do seem uniquely a- unable as a rich country, a rich developed country to solve very tricky, tricky uh, policy questions. Mm-hmm. You know, you end up painting yourselves into corners where you can't actually get out of them. Yeah, And I'm afraid that this one might be one of them too. But then on the other hand, like we're starting to see really meaningful bans on 
totally unethical medical practices on children. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see a lot of states, like I think 20 something states now have at least some level of bans on men competing in women's sports. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't think I'd have predicted either of those two years ago. I think I was more pessimistic about American developments than I would be now. Is it as much of a culture war thing in the UK as it is here in the sense that you know, it's it's very much red states that are putting these bans on and and it seems like Republicans are the majority of people who are speaking out and it makes people who might be left wing who silently have some agreement not want to get on board and support it because it's one of those signals like you're right wing. Yeah, definitely not. It's really nothing like that here. Like the trans lobby tries to make it like that all the time. They're always trying to say that people like me are, you know, far right American wing nuts and that we're funded <laughs> by the Heritage Foundation and so on. And listen, I I'm not against right wing people. Yeah. I'm I'm really not. Like I hate this idea that left wing people are good and right wing people yeah, are bad. I agree. It so happens I'm not right wing. Right. I'm not left wing either. I'm really I'm politically homeless now, but I would have yeah. said previously that I was very much in the middle. No, uh, the strongest opposition here has come from uh, women who are centrist to left mm. and people who self-identify as sort of liberal, which here doesn't mean the equivalent of being a Democrat. It means that you care about the rule of law and free speech and evidence-based policymaking and so on. Right. It's not religious here. It's really not. I mean, most religious people are against this stuff because, you know, they believe some version of male and female, he created them. Mm -hmm. But the organised resistance to gender ideology has been from secular uh, women, left-wing, um, often trades unionists, and so on. So yeah, it's. I mean, they try to make it into a culture war, but that's just a lie. They just right. say, oh, you know, this is a, you're importing American culture wars, and you're like, well, you imported a crazy American ideology and tried to impose it on all of us, right? And now when we <laughs> fight back, you're saying it's war. I'm like, I did not start this war. You brought this war to me. Yeah, it's been pretty wild. I just the piece I literally filed this morning before I. I got on with you is about how no one gives a shit about women. I'm essentially more politically homeless than ever before. And I was talking about how in America, I really perceived this first during Monica Lewinsky. You know, that I was, I was kind of coming mm. of age. I was around 18, but she was f around five years older than me. So I identified the most with her in the whole spectrum. And the adults all around me seemed to be more concerned with all of the fanfare and the politics around it. And I was like, what about this girl? And she was really the first kind of major media pile on to exist because it was the dawn of the 24 hour news cycle. And I just remember asking my mom, like, what about this girl? Everybody's selling her out and on both sides using her to to for whatever their political ends might be. And she was um, just seemed so young, you know, just so, she seems so young to me. And I've kind mm. of come full circle. I went to the left because I kind of I think rightfully felt like the left in America was the only party that cared about women. But as they've embraced this gender ideology, I can't say that anymore at all. And the other day I was giving on Twitter, I was saying something about the right because they're like, oh, we don't want your horror vote because now there's this very weird purity stuff rising on the right again that is very reminiscent of kind of moral majority with no God, which is even scarier to me. And the left was like, oh, the leopard's eating your face. I'm like, I don't want to hear from you guys either. You can't even define what a woman is. And I feel more, yeah. I feel more adrift than ever before. I'm like, I'll vote yeah, for I mean, whoever I, I feel cares about women, yeah. which is no one. It's very I strange. know. I don't know who I'll vote for next time. I really don't. And I've never felt that. I've always been a strong believer, especially as a woman. We didn't have the vote until very recently. Like I always, I was very sanctimonious. I used to say to people like, there's always one party that's not as terrible as the others. So you vote for the least worst option. But I am through with that. I yeah. am through with voting for people who don't give a shit about me. Yeah. And at the moment, I'm really not clear that anyone gives a shit about I me. I am in the exact same boat. And honestly, Helen, I do not think we are alone because- my no. my DMs have been filled with, um, it's very interesting. You know, I've been very critical of the excesses of Me Too and things like that because of 
the erosion of things like due process. I've been very critical yes. of using hate speech as a way to cudgel and silence opponents. And now there's this rising reaction, which many of us could have predicted, which is like, Me Too skirt is a little too short, you know, <laughs> like, like yeah. all of this is feminism's fault. All of the problems are. Oh, God, that drives me mad. <laughs> that drives me so mad. I mean, Nash Walsh, like, like that was, that film had loads of good things about it. It did. Which is a woman. Like, you know, kudos to him for getting the, 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 the absolute wing nuts to say those crazy <laughs> things on camera like that was great work on the other hand this is a man who says that like literally every bad thing that has ever happened is feminism's fault mm. like i didn't think we were that powerful frankly yeah but you know if you specifically look at the gender stuff that he says is all feminism's fault and you think like did we create cross-dressing men who get a sexual kick out of going into women's changing rooms nope did we create the blokes in the 1950s and 60s and 70s who ran gender clinics and thought that what women and men were was gender roles and mm -hmm. that you could bring little children up in whichever gender nope we were the people who were saying no to the gender roles you know you just can't say it's us it's it's like okay there are people who call themselves feminists who talk about gender as if it's meaningful and who sign up to all this bullshit and yes there's lots of them and I think they're awful and I don't think they're feminists, but like, you just can't say this is all about feminism. That's just, that's just Matt Walshism, you know? Their argument is that in saying that women could do whatever men could do, that, um, that's what opened the door to this. <laughs> Like, oh, I mean, my God, like, I want to be able to vote. I want to get a PhD in mathematics, which is what I do have. I want to be able to work. I don't want my husband to be able to legally rape me. Therefore, a man who gets erotically turned on by putting on women's clothes was given license to come into women's changing rooms. Like, this is, it's just a total non sequitur. Like, I think even Matt Walsh knows that. I don't think he's that stupid. It's been so interesting seeing this is what's been, you know, since your book came out to me watching this all play out in America because and have you been paying attention to the stuff going on in Canada? Oh, my God. Yes. So yes. The, and that actually uh, that's making me feel a bit more optimistic, too. I thought Canada was actually lost, but it turns out the parents are finally waking up. Yeah. So for people who are listening and don't know, which is usually a lot of people, actually, because I don't blame them for tuning out of all of this stuff. There are mass protests all across Canada from parents who are protesting gender ideology, which, again, I've realized I don't know that a lot of people even know what that is. They can point to it or they can perceive it. How would you define gender ideology? Right. So, I mean, anyone who's older than maybe 35 has probably never given a moment's thought to this. But, you know, human beings come in two types, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we are mammals. We reproduce sexually, birds and bees stuff. There are women and there are men and there is nothing else. And you can't turn women into men and you can't turn men into women. We all knew that. Evolution gave us that. Or if you are a, um, if, if it's your religious belief that God gave you that, fine. I'm not going to argue with it. As far as I'm concerned, these are evolved categories. Apparently, we're all now meant to believe that what makes you a man or a woman is what you say you are. And you may think that when you hear trans, that what they mean is, well, we really know that he's really a man, but it makes him very unhappy when you call him a man. So he wants to dress as like a woman as he can, and he wants you to pretend that he's a woman. And if you go along with that, his mental health will be much better. That's not what they mean. They mean he's really a woman. Right. They mean he's as much a woman as someone like you or me who's actually female. Mm -hmm. And then they say all sorts of bizarre things like that sex is a spectrum or that sex is assigned at birth or that, you know, 1.7% of people are intersex. And I've literally never met someone I couldn't classify as male or female. And I know people with intersex conditions mm -hmm. through this work. So, and now they're teaching children all this stuff. They're telling children that it's bigoted to say you know, that if you're born a boy, you will always be a boy until you're a man and you'll be male all your life. They're saying that you choose which you are and that if you uh, perform sex stereotypes for girls, so if you like pink and you like Barbie dolls and you want to do gymnastics, you are a girl, even if you were assigned male at birth. And if you like rugby and shooting and hunting and fishing and climbing trees and you, know, you don't like gossip and you don't like makeup, even if you were assigned female at birth, you're really a boy. And all of this is being taught in classrooms all over America. Mm -hmm. And people are being told that it's a civil right, right to say which sex you are. Like that's gender ideology. And it's in classrooms all over um, all the English speaking world and much of, um, of Europe as well.
And in your book, you talk about how this spread so quickly and it doesn't seem to be, there seems to be pushback, but it doesn't seem to be slowing down. It actually seems to be more and more enshrined in policy and HR and all of these departments that are responsible for like the, you know, way in which we're supposed to have discussions Speak about things like age, chest yeah. feeding. And I, I mean, being pregnant and going through some of the, the, the online because it was COVID birthing classes where they were referring to us as birthing persons. You could see the people no on way. zoom just like rolling their eye. I'm like, who it, it was infuriating. It was it, with the pregnancy hormones. It was just enraging. I was like, this is, this is just bananas. Yeah, it really is bananas. And I mean, I think what happened was that the great majority of people who know this is bananas weren't looking while it happened. You know, so it's something that was very much born out of uh, 1990s and 2000 campuses, mm. American coastal campuses, basically. And, you know, I think for too long, the rest of us just thought, oh, you know, that's ivory tower bullshit. You know, that's just the gender studies people talking the usual nonsense. Like they're just publishing it in their journals that nobody reads except themselves. And it just, you know, it just didn't seem like an issue for the rest of us. But it was like a lab leak. <laughs> you know, it made it out into, as you say, HR departments, because if you've got a gender studies degree or you studied sociology or something like that, you're not actually fit to do anything useful. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to get a job, though, and you're a graduate. So what sort of thing do you do? You go into something like uh, university administration or perhaps teaching. And I mean, teaching is a noble profession but unfortunately is done by a lot of not very good people as well. Or you go into HR or you get a job like that you hope is going to be a kind of graduate -y job like journalism or something that's very badly paid now. And then you start making a nuisance of yourself with the silly theories that you learned in university. <laughs> and all the same people were looking other the other way. Yeah. And then because it's so bonkers, like I really, I really found this that when when I started to notice this was happening, which was in 2017, 2018, and I realized that it was as crazy as it sounds, like they really genuinely were saying, like the organizations that were set up to support gay people were genuinely saying that sexual orientation was based on your declared gender identity. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that a woman who's a lesbian, her dating pool is both men and women. Right. Like ordinarily bodied men, ordinarily bodied women, but they just have to identify as women. Mm -hmm. So now suddenly a heterosexual man can be a lesbian. And this is obviously massively homophobic. Right. But anyway, that's what they were saying. And it's so barking mad that when you try and pitch that as a story to an editor who's older, you know, my age or older than me, that they can't believe it's right. So they think that you're the mad one. Yeah. And they're starting to look at you kind of side eye. Like, mm, you know, I'm not very sure about this story. That can't be right. You know, I always thought that Stonewall or the ACLU were good organizations. They can't possibly be saying that. But they are. And that gave them some extra years in which they could keep putting their tentacles out through HR and these charities that have these schemes that, you know, you get marked as a Stonewall diversity champion if you do things like make everybody wear lanyards with their pronouns on or, right. uh, you know, make all the toilets gender neutral at work or whatever. And then by the time, the same people looked around and went, my God, you know, like, like this is years later than we should have started fighting this. It was really embedded yeah. and often or two. Yeah, that was, I remember when my dad asked me about four years ago, what the pronoun thing was. And I was like, we were at breakfast. So I was like, do you have three hours? Because in order to even explain it, you have to explain self IDing and all these concepts that are like to a boomer are just like, what are you talking? What nonsense is this? And they did grow up yeah, in the civil the rights confidence. movement. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They don't have the confidence to say this is bonkers. You know, you think, oh, you know, this is the new thing. And the thing is, if you are a boomer, you've had that experience of growing up through civil rights. And so you've had that experience of, of being told something when you were young, like that, you know, gay men are perverts and they're all pedophiles, or you've been told, you know, you know, but black people, you know, it's natural to you that maybe they live in a less good society than white people or whatever. And then as you grew up, you realize that those were shocking injustices. Yeah. And you re-examined yourself. So you learned that your um, unthinking prejudices were bad things. And of course, it's great that we learned that. It's brilliant that we learned that. But I think we overcorrected in the sense that people started to think that anything they used to believe that younger people are now challenging, they must be wrong on. 
rather than saying, you know what, you were right on the gay rights, you were right on the racial stuff. This thing of saying that men can be women and women can be men, that's barking and I'm not doing it. Yeah. So people didn't have the self-confidence to stop in the right place and they just kept going past the natural boundary of what they should have been doing. It's so interesting that you use the word boundary because this is something that I don't think women are traditionally great at. And I just wrote this piece about like why it's important women feel fear and how I grew up Gen X with all this feminism that was very much like get in their face, be loud, don't make a man comfortable. And in one or two generations, it's gone to just suddenly accommodating a small minority of men <laughs> who want access. To, I'm like, ah. What is this teaching our kids, our daughters? This is it's terrible. I know. I mean, to put, yeah. To, I, I often think we're telling girls they're support humans. Like yeah. If you see the way they talk about women's sports, it's really, really obvious. Like they say that Riley Gaines, who's this brilliant swimmer. I mean, she was at one point she was fifth in the whole of America. Like, think how good she is. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, you know, she's just a sore loser. Yeah. Because Leah Thomas, who's a bloke, who's like, you know, 10 inches or something like that, taller than her, has had all the benefit of um, testosterone in puberty. You know, he comes along and he just swims like a bloke. And of course, he can beat even the best women because he's a moderately good man. And, and she's saying this isn't fair. And they're saying you're a sore loser. And then they say things like, oh, the value of sport is in the taking part. You're like, oh, nobody says that to men. Sod off. No. Like nobody says to, you know, Michael Phelps. Uh, I'm going to put weights on your ankles and it won't matter because, you know, the value is taking part. And it's, right. it's, a good, it's good for you to lose. And like, and then, and then you see, you look at these girls and they're on the podium and they're clapping this bloke who's just stolen the gold medal. And you know that they feel they have to, because if they don't, they'll lose all their friends and they lose sponsorship. And Riley Gaines told me that her university told her that if she kept speaking out about it, she would never get into grad school and she would never get a job. Yep. And yeah. And I mean, that was not like, that was not unrealistic advice. That no. Was true. Have you spoken to Paula Scanlon? Oh, yes, I have. She yeah. was at the same conference that Riley and I met at, which was this one in Denver run by ICOMS, which is women's sport. It's a great organization that's really helping to coordinate efforts all over America to stand up for Title IX, you know, to get college girls able to have college sport and school girls to get school sport. Uh, without always being able to identify into it yeah and so yeah I met I met Paula there too and I mean you know she was talking about like it's not just about the losing and the unfairness it's about the the sexual threat the that's boundaries posed by yeah, yeah. Men being allowed into the women's changing rooms have you listened to her describe or Riley Gaines describe what it's like to change into the professional swimsuits do you know this no it I had Paula on recently but I we didn't talk about that Okay, well, I didn't know this until they talked about this at this conference. So um, when you're a competitive swimmer, you wear these extremely tight, very rigid swimsuits that are really hard to get on and off. And you have to strip naked and there's no possibility of holding a towel around you. And you kind of bounce yourself into them over several yeah, minutes. Yeah. Um, and so if you are at a meet, a, a, swimming, a swimming competition, you might have several competitions during the day. Say you have two or three. And you'll do a warm up swim for every one of those. And you don't wear your com competition swimsuit for that. You wear uh, like a less elaborate, stiff one. So you strip completely naked. You put on your uh, your pre, your warm up swimsuit. You go out, you do your warm up. You can wait, strip completely naked again. And then you wriggle yourself into this swimsuit. You go, you do your competition. You yank yourself out of it again. And then you do it all again, possibly twice more in the same day. Mm -hmm. And there's maybe 100, 150 women in this big open space. Everybody's doing the same. And there's this bloke. Sorry, with his cock out. Oh, God. Doing the same. Yeah. And he did. And they complained. And they were told she's a woman. That is. And if you, com and if you complain, we will, you know, you will get dropped from the team. You will be ostracized. You will <laughs> never get a job. You will never go into another university. Um, I mean, Paul, I think, said that she went and she, maybe it was she. I think it was she who said, but somebody at the conference said that they went and changed in a um, cleaning cupboard themselves. But it's her, it's her changing room. It's not for the men. Yeah. It's for the women. Yeah. One of the things that really struck me, and it's I haven't connected. It, it was something I didn't even consider, but Paula talked about it when she was on our podcast, how I, I sh they kept thinking the adults would step in. They had heard that this person, yes. Leah Thomas, and they kept thinking that somebody, like they were like, this can't, you know, it won't actually happen. And then- so she was a junior 
and Leo was a senior and then COVID hit and they thought that it would just take care of itself because she was going to be done with school and they would all be seniors and she would have aged out of college. But Leah took a gap year. And so they came back and the school was like, you should just be happy to be here. You should just be grateful that you're not wearing masks while you're swimming I mean, the level of gaslighting and then with COVID and she was saying, you know, we were just, we had been so isolated. We lost a year of competition and we were just so grateful because that there wasn't the pushback that there might've been because of COVID. And I was like, it is like beyond sinister that that happened to those girls. And then they tried to make them feel bad. Like you should just be grateful that you're competing at all because of COVID as trying to excuse us. It makes me. I mean, it's very like a mugging. You yeah. know, if, if you talk to somebody who has been um, attacked randomly on the street, you know, often the injury might not be that bad. Like it might just have been a slap or something like that. But they've lost all faith in everyday activities and they're scared maybe to go out and they become very, you know, hyper alert and so on. Because what you realize is you have up till now thought the world was a safe place and now you know it's not. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, I mean, I have I'm, I have not had the experience, I'm so glad, of being raped or of suffering domestic violence, but I have visited a lot of women's centres and talked to a lot of women who have. And women who have been victimised repeatedly, uh, they have lost all sense that anybody gives a shit about them, frankly. Mm -hmm. And they think the world is an unsafe place and that nobody will stand up for them. And, that, you know, and they don't even think they're worth it. They think that they're the sort of people that nobody stands up for. And then in women's centers, often what you're trying to do is to rebuild their faith and help them to come together and support each other, but also be an institution that's supportive for them, that's trauma informed, because they've got to slowly regain their trust in humanity. So what these girls learned was that nobody gives a shit about them, that mm -hmm. the grown ups are willing to let this happen. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's an outrageous thing to teach girls at university. That's why it's these conversations I have with the young Younger women, I'm so delicate. I feel like I've talked to a couple of detransitioners on the podcast and they're young. And I mean, they're just the, what they've been through. It, it, it is not fair that their stories don't get a, the same amount of attention that all of these other feel good stories about trans kids, et cetera, get because their stories are horrific. And I'm glad to see in America more they and really more are. people are suing. Because I said, like, when I first yes. started hearing about this and reading about this and being like, is anyone going to say anything like you yourself? Um, I was I was like, the only thing that will stop this is lawsuits. That's it. In America, and especially in America, yeah. Yeah, we're and so I, litigious. And I I worried that they had managed to snooker their way out of that because mm -hmm. they learned a lot. The trans lobby learned a lot from the experience with them um, false memories and recovered memory syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't want to get into a, you know, like which memories are real, which memories are false, because of course there have been genuine victims of childhood sex abuse who have been brushed off and told that it was that what they're doing is lying or right. that it was just invented. But, but it is also true that there were without any doubt, totally false claims that were created by therapists who had wrong ideas about how memories work and how minds work and who sort of auto suggested into the mind of very vulnerable people that they had experienced these horrific situations that could be proved to have been false. And so those people, you know, sometimes people went to jail for those crimes. And I mean, often the therapy that caused the false memories was paid for on insurance. Wow. And then, the, you know, there were a couple of lawsuits where, um, you know, people who have been wrongly convicted and wrongly accused of horrific crimes at one very major compensation. And then the, um, the health insurance companies stopped paying for that sort of treatment. Mm. And then after that, the trans lobby um, over the next sort of 10 to 20 years after that, very carefully um, made lots of state laws that said things like, you know, short statute of limitations that capped the damages that you could get, that said that you couldn't have class actions and these sorts of things, that it would be a defence to say that um, this sort of care was mandated. And then they also put a load of trans care into the Obama care mandates. So now, you know, to be an Obama, to be a uh, a health insurance company that sells insurance under Obamacare, you have to include a load of gender affirming care, as okay. they call it, in other words. 
you know so so they they really set themselves up to be very hard to sue yeah and and I, I knew that I thought like in, around the time I was writing my book that was one of the type things that made me very negative and very pessimistic about America what I didn't foresee is that there would be um, organized groups in some states actually un- deliberately unpicking those laws or passing laws saying that if you do these things there will be no statute of limitations or we will allow people to sue for 35 years so actually you know overriding these laws and so we are starting to see insurers uh, pulling back on this and rightly so i mean i don't know why and it's not just medicine here listen like if you believe that men can become women and you act on that in any policy what you're going to be doing is putting men into spaces where men should not be places yeah. like dormitories um school changing rooms camps um, rape crisis shelters homeless shelters you are doing a very dangerous thing you're foreseeably creating risk if i were anyone who were doing that i would be checking that i'm not personally liable that I'm not somebody who has signed off on this, that I'm not the person who has fiduciary duty for that company, because what you are doing is you are setting yourself up to be on the, the nasty end of a lawsuit. I can't understand how people can't see that. Yeah, it's, it, what what inspired you to write your book? What was, the, was there kind of a dark night of the soul or what, <laughs> what was the moment that you realized you had oh, to God. write this? I, I mean, there was a moment, but, um, and I'll tell you the moment, but I, after I wrote the book, I read a very interesting book about how the way that we think is not the way that we think we think. Mm. Like what I mean is when we examine ourselves and we think, oh, I made this decision in this way based on this fact at this moment, actually that's just kind of a story we're telling ourselves to make ourselves feel good after we've already decided. So I'll tell you the story and then I'll tell you what I think really happened. So well, tell me the so story, I, you tell know, me what you think, yeah. and then tell me the name of that book because I, I want to well, read I've it. I've forgotten it. That's the embarrassing oh, okay. thing. I, I'll, have to, I'll have to give it to you to put in the show notes. <laughs> That's I'll look fine. It up. It's upstairs on my bedside table. Um, so I was asked to write it. That's all. I was asked to look into it and find somebody to write about it for The Economist where I was working at the time. I ended up writing about it myself. I found it very strange. I found the way that people acted towards me when I asked to interview them very strange. I found the things people were saying strange, the language strange, all of it was just like nothing, nothing like anything else I'd written about before. And that interested me. Mm -hmm. So I kept thinking about it. And so my first article was in 2017. And then by 2018, the summer of 2018, I went on a walking holiday on my own in Ireland, which is where I'm from. And I went on a walk for about, I think about seven days. And there's this, I, I had read this article in the Irish Times about what's called St. Declan's Way. So St. Declan, I, I mean, I'm not religious at all anymore, although I was brought up Catholic. St. Declan, um, he was a, he was a, you know, Catholic, I guess, priest. I don't know if you call them priests at the time, but he went on a pilgrimage to meet St. Patrick and he took a particular route And there was a group of landowners and walkers along the route who were taking the time to mark the route and to open it up and make sure that people would walk along it. So I just on impulse decided, you know, I was thinking about this topic all the time and I wanted to give myself some headspace. So I decided I went on my own and I walked this walk over. It's about it's only about 120 kilometers. So I think I did it over six days and I was just walking all day, no headphones, you know, I didn't read anything and I was just staying on my own in little B&Bs and that each night. And I came back from it thinking I've got to write a book about this, um, but it doesn't fit well with my day job. And I don't know that I'm the right person to do it. You know, I mean, I was the finance editor of The Economist at the time. And I kept thinking about it for several months and I asked around about agents and so on and, you know, got rejected by people and got told that I was a bigot and that sort of thing. <laughs> and then in, I think it must have been, was it 2019? It must have been in 2019, I met some detransitioners and you've had the same experience. It was very clarifying. And and I have a gay son myself. So I have two sons who are now 22 and 17 and the younger one is gay. And I've always known he was going to be gay. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I don't know, no. Like, obviously, if he wasn't, I'd just have gone, gosh, you're a very camp straight man, but that's fine. (laughs) But anyway, so... You know, so I have a soft spot for gender non-conforming kids. And these mm-hmm. were all girls, but they had all been very gender non-conforming when they were little. And they had all fallen into thinking that meant they were boys and they had gone through medical treatment, uh, some of them right up to having their ovaries and uterus removed. Mm-hmm. Um, and I listened to them talk about how they it didn't make them feel better. They bitterly regretted being lied to. They now recognize that they were lesbians who had been, um, who just got a contagious idea in their heads, mm-hmm. who had been misled by doctors. 
you know, their parents were distraught because their parents had gone along with this because they thought it would help. Mm. And that night I was staying in a, an Airbnb um, and I just went back to the Airbnb and I just, I couldn't sleep. And I just kept thinking, you know, they're sterilizing gay kids, they're sterilizing mm. gay kids. I've got to write about this. Uh. And so that's, that's the origin story of the book. But I actually think that I had decided I wanted to write it well before that. And I was waiting for the excuse. Right. What I mean is, um, you know, I wasn't weighing it up in the sort of rational way that you do. I don't think people do. I think we do the rational weighing up afterwards. That's the story we tell ourselves. So I think I really badly wanted to write it. And it wasn't for anything so noble and grand as that makes it sound. I wanted to write it because I couldn't stop thinking about it and it was driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do it because I really needed to clear my head about it. And I was, I was thinking like, that's not a great reason. Like I wasn't putting those words in my head, right. but I was thinking like, you know, it's not my job. I'm not the right person. You needed permission. <laughs> I need time. I needed permission. Yeah. I needed to give myself permission. And so then along came this event and I was able to give myself permission because like, seriously, if they're sterilizing gay kids and you look away. Like if I go home the next day and just go, whoops, they're sterilizing gay kids. Imagine that. Like, who am I? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so, so I think that's the truth is I just wanted to write it because it was driving me insane. And then I met these kids and I thought, Jesus Christ, they're sterilizing gay kids. And now it's become almost everything you do. Is Yeah, it is everything I do yeah. actually. Um, so I, I didn't go back. I, st I mean, the economists were very good to me. They didn't bully me out or anything like that. Uh, I couldn't write about it there though, because the economist has no bylines. And that means that we're quite uh, strict about who, you know, like if somebody's very much associated with one side of an argument, they don't cover that beat. Uh, so I was doing other jobs. I was the finance editor and then I was the Britain editor. And in between, I did some work with events. And these are great jobs. Like if someone had said to me 20 years ago that I would have these jobs, I would have been like, my God, they're dream jobs in journalism and the best publication in the world. But I was still thinking all the time about, you know, how can this crazy thing be happening? It's breaking all our institutions. It's destroying children's lives. It's pulling families apart. You know, it's sending women's rights back to the dark ages. It's just a lie. It's a massive lie at the heart of all. Of, you know, I actually think it's a genuine threat to democracy and liberal values. I think it's that serious. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to take a year's leave of absence in 2021, in March 2021, and go and work with a campaign group called Sex Matters that had just been founded, which campaigns for clarity about sex in mm -hmm. law and policymaking. And then after the end of the year, I didn't go back. Yeah. So I work part time now for Sex Matters and I write my own stuff on my own newsletter, thehelenjoyce.com. And I have a col uh, column in The Critic and I just do other stuff. And I don't regret it. I mean, I miss The Economist because it's a great place. But honestly, I had got so bored trying to, you know, write stories about British politics when my head was somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think that I had you told me when I was trying to do comedy and um, like was a waitress, I was just reading something I wrote from 2015. And I was, I'm like, there's no way you could have told me that I would be having these conversations. And 90% of the time or 100% of the time, I'm like, still part of me is baffled that we're even having the discussion. It, oh, it happens to me at least once a day. At least once a day, I boggle. Like I think I, I'm sorry. You what? <laughs> you know, because the thing is, this is mad. Yeah. Like you know, it's 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 genuinely clinically insane. <laughs> like if we hadn't had this cultural moment, if you were to go back, you know, a hundred years or hundred and fifty years, and you met somebody who said, you know, like somebody who looks like me who said I'm a man, or someone who looks like my husband who said I'm a woman that's as dumb as saying you're Napoleon, you know, like it's obviously certifiable. Mm -hmm. So we have created a social movement out of an obvious crazy delusion. And the consequence is that the craziness is everywhere because we've embedded it everywhere. Like HR departments are saying crazy things. Governments are saying crazy things. Doctors are saying crazy things, you know, charities, NGOs, you know, sporting bodies. And, and the funny thing about this one was well, not funny at all. It's horrific is it breaks things in exactly the place where they're meant to work. So mm. if you are a women's rights organization and you decide that men can be women, 
it doesn't just break you as in you go and do some random other stuff or you become useless. You actually become a men's rights organization. Right. You turn through 180 degrees and you work back against your actual founding principles. And, and this works for all of them. Like, you know, anti-censorship organizations become censorship organizations. Gay rights organizations become horrific, rapey, disgusting organizations trying to push heterosexual men on lesbians and to try to sterilize gay kids. It's bananas. You know, the um, national statistics officers say, oh, it doesn't really matter what you write in the census, just write whatever you feel like for your sex. Like, this is dumb. Yeah. Like, everyone is, is abandoning their missions. It's breaking everything. Wow. That was something that was so chilling at the, uh, about your book that I think you do such an incredible job pointing out. And when I was interviewing um, Douglas Murray for a piece I did for The Spectator about what happened to Pride, he made, I mean, I mean, I wish I could just publish the entire interview that I did with him because he's just so brilliant and insightful on all of this. But he made the point that the United States is behind because we didn't have the benefit of having somebody like, say, Oprah, who, in your case, J.K. Rowling, who is uncancelable and a massive, you know, formidable force who is coming out and saying, like, this is nonsense. And no one in the United States is doing that still. Still, there really yeah. isn't yeah. anyone huge and mainstream who's willing to take that risk and say, and say, what about the women? I guess like two weeks ago, I, I think it, after writing all these pieces, I don't know if you've gone through this. I was very fighting depression, you know, feeling like yeah. um, there was just this sense. Forces that are against us. Yeah. And, and the, the forces sense against us are just huge. that no one is coming. That that very real sense that we women have been abandoned in the culture wars after making so much progress. And now, even if you're a woman who's been critical of the excesses of Me Too, critical of Believe All Women, which was nonsense, critical of some of the the kind of woke stuff that we see, if you call out the misogyny on say the right, which I believe is rising and in a reaction to this, but also on the left, you're just piled on by everybody. And it, it's, yeah. it's very disheartening to me because I, as I have a daughter now, I don't know what the world will look like for her. It's, it's I mean, scary. I mean, I cope with that by, um, you know, by having the organization and the network around me because you know, if you actually face up to what you're doing and what's happening, it's, it is it is formidable what's against us. Like, you know, this ideology has absolutely co-opted pretty much everything that was meant to protect people against, you know, the fact that the dominant version of humanity was adult men. So, you know, the world was built for straight adult men and the rest of us have had to try and make our way. Like, you know, children, um, you know, like I'm not saying children should have rights at the same level of adult as, as adults. They can't. They're not adults. Adults need to look after them. But you know, children aren't just chattel. They aren't just the possession of their um, their parents. Right. And you know, women's rights and black people's rights and the new gay people's rights. All these all these groups that were not given full human rights. The full human rights were only for straight white men, uh, adults, and. And all these institutions that were set up in order that the rest of us could have a fair shake, all those institutions are now working against us. They're they're trying to make things actively worse for <laughs> gay people, for women, for children. I mean, I won't even talk about race. I'm not an expert on race. And anyway, race in America is a whole toxic mess that the rest of us don't have to put up with. Yeah. So, so like that's actually very depressing because those are institutions that are well they've got good names if you haven't been looking at what's going on you probably think they're still doing good work mm -hmm. and they are you know they've got money behind them they've got laws behind them they're in all the institutions like employers and they're actively working to make things worse for the people they were set up to protect so we've just got this enormous force against us um on the other hand we have right on our side and I, you know, here in the UK, like Turf Island, as it's called, you know, trans exclusionary <laughs> radical feminist, I'm none of those things. Well, I'm a feminist, but I'm not a radical feminist. Um, and I'm not trans exclusionary. Yeah. Like, all women are women and all men are men. I'm excluding nobody. Um, but yeah, we've got, you know, we've got, we've got some traction here and we've got support from each other. 
And I, I don't wake up feeling depressed because I know what I have to do. I have a purpose. I actually wake up feeling very cheerful every day. And by the end of the time at The Economist, I didn't. I woke up mm. feeling sick every day because I wasn't doing what I knew I should be doing. Mm. And there's a there's an expression I, I learned visiting a women's centre recently for some other work I'm doing. It's a really interesting conversation. And I learned a lot from this woman. I mean, this sounds like it's a side issue, but I, I, I mean, you'll see the point when I get to the point. Um, she was telling me how hard it is to work with probation now because probation has been cut really beyond any other service of government services here. And, you know, all the, the experienced probation officers have gone off sick. And, you know, the women's centres are often working with women who are on probation or who are being diverted to probation rather than sending them to jail in the hope they don't go to jail. Right. Anyway, she said, you know, you can't do good work. And then she said, have you come across the concept of a moral injury? I said, no. And she said, well, a moral injury is when you know what you should be doing, but you cannot do it. And it makes people sick. And I thought, oh, God, yeah, that, that's actually sort of what I was experiencing towards the end of trying mm. to keep going at The Economist. I knew what I should be doing, and it wasn't this. And every day I was feeling sick. And as soon as I, you know, got over the fear, because I had one of the greatest jobs in all of journalism, you know, and I threw it away, as soon as I got over the fear of doing that, every day I wake up now thinking I'm in the right place and I'm doing what I should be doing. And that makes up for everything else. I saw this video of you recently and you were walking in a protest and you were smiling while everybody was, um, aren't you? I'll send you, you the longer version of that though? if you like. Why? And what it was, oh, because you'll see what I really felt. <laughs> I mean, I liked so that happened? you were kind of cheerfully smiling at people who are calling you horrible names and, you know, it's, yeah. but do you feel, do you feel any sense of your, you know, being afraid in those moments or are you, do you guys have it, protection? It in that moment. It was a very, it was a very interesting experience. So what happened was a few months ago, Sex Matters, the organisation I work for, we had our quarterly board meeting in Manchester. Now, we mostly have them in London because it's the easy place for everybody to get to, but two of our board members are, are live in Manchester, as it happens, and we thought, you know, fair's fair, we'll go there. Right. <laughs> and um, we booked a, a meeting room in the People's History Museum, which is this really nice venue, and I highly, I still highly recommend, even after what I've experienced, if you go to Manchester, you should go there because it's a history of democracy. It's the Museum of Democracy and Protest. And they have loads of original suffragette materials because the Pankhursts were a Manchester family. Wow. So they have the banner, they have the original First in the Fight banner, and they have wow. all these props like the signs and the bonnets and the sashes. And you can dress yourself up like a suffragette and get your friends to take pictures of you in front of the banner. It's great. I, of course, did that. <laughs> anyway, we had our board meeting there and it was lovely. And we tweeted about it afterwards and we said, you know, it was great to be here. And then they, they got complaints. I mean, they got complaints, I think, from... I'm not making this up or exaggerating, a 19-year-old they-them who is the LGBTQIA++ liaison for the Green Party. Now, the Green Party is just, no, but this is just a kid. He's just a boy, right? Yeah. He complained to them and he said it was very disappointing that they had hosted us. And, um, and they then put out this letter, public apology about, you know, how they had fallen below the standards expected and they hadn't oh, realised we didn't share their values and they would never do such a thing again. Like the whole, the whole, you know, bloody people's revolution maoist china sort of forced confession <laughs> the struggle session but the thing is yes it was it was it was it was absolutely that and then, you know, i recognize it will take time to win back the trust of the oh, trans God. community it's like, like just one eight person people sitting in a room talking about our strategy yeah i mean fuck's sake just fuck's sake yeah anyway so um <laughs> that's belief discrimination in uk law what they did and they literally put out a statement that in UK law is exactly the same as if they had said, sorry, we gave a room to the Jews. Yeah. But we know all about the blood libel. We're very sorry. We do not uh, you know, share their values. We will never do such a thing again. So we immediately, like the next day, we just sent them an email saying, we'd a lovely time. Can we book a room again, please? And they must have gone off to their lawyers <laughs> and realised what they had just done. And so they booked us the room. Anyway, so what we used the room for was a teach-in on equality and human rights law as it pertains to sex in the UK. And it was lovely. We had a great event. It was fine. There were these idiot protesters blocking the way in. The police were a bit clueless. The museum had signalled, of course, that we were the baddies and these fascist protesters outside with masks and foghorns bellowing fuck Helen Joyce, that they were the good guys. And then when we left, 
somebody told them that we were coming out the back exit, I don't know who, and they were there waiting for us and they followed us down the street, all of us, all 50 of us. So the video that you've seen, I mean, I was going like this with my phone videoing them and I wasn't smiling. <laughs> I was just trying to get some people who weren't wearing masks. And then to my astonishment, in among the whole, you know, they have these stupid alerta, alerta, anti-fascista, trans women are women, you know, all yeah. the usual slogans. Yeah. They started bellowing, fuck Helen Joyce, my body, my choice. And they're like right next to me. <laughs> like I'm not talking about down the street. I'm talking beside me. Big men with fog horns bellowing this. And I, you know, I had my camera not looking at me at that instant. And then I put on my selfie face. Like this wasn't deliberate. I just put on my selfie face and turned it back to me. And I'm doing my but the face that I do whenever someone <laughs> says, Can I take a picture with you? Uh -huh. <laughs> and I did 30 seconds of this. And uh, the full minute, you can see what I was actually feeling in the first 30 seconds, which is I'm pretty, pretty uncomfortable about this. These blokes are scary. There's only yeah. a few police. Yeah. I don't know how we're going to get out of this. And then as soon as it got so personal, and I put my brave face because I'm not letting the bullies see. Uh, I've reported it as a crime and the police are treating it as a crime. It's a public order offence. Oh, so if okay. they can identify anyone who's there, they will be arresting them. Oh, good. Um, Oh, well, I don't know if they'll identify anyone. Everyone's wearing their COVID masks. How handy know. is that? I know. It's yeah. an inconvenient now that you can just wear masks everywhere. And it was interesting <laughs> watching. I, Luna, I've looked back at the video many times. As I turn the phone, you can see people just pulling their masks up or putting their banner in front of their face. And they have it so smooth. Like they're looking to see who's filming and that, you know? Yeah. But so it was scary. We, we, we actually got to a major road, all of us, you know, and there was no way out and there weren't enough police. And then I asked one of the policemen what I should do. And he was like, well, you know. And then I said, but that's me they're chanting about. And he hadn't realized that. He hadn't realized that it was the, the Helen Joyce that they were saying, fuck Helen Joyce, that she was there. <laughs> and they were also chanting about Maya Forstatter, my colleague at Sex Matters. Yeah. I mean, Maya, Maya is a liar. Like as Maya said, like, she heard that when she was four. They're such right. babies. Anyway, so when they realized that they were chanting about two actual individuals, they got serious and they called a cop car and we told everybody else to break off in groups of six or whatever. And we would stay with the few police who were there so that everybody else could leave and they, the protesters would stay with us. And then the cop car came and picked us up and took us away. So that was our way out. But, you know, Jesus. it was it was hairy feeling. Yeah, that I mean, I again, I wonder, is it going to take like women getting beat up by a bunch of men before people realize how ridiculous this is? I don't know that people will ever realize, actually. I mean, I, I have been saying to myself for five or six years, you know, what will it take? And when I found out about this first, I, I was so naive and so many other people have said the same to me, like when you discover that they really mean it, that men can be women. Like they're not just saying it to be nice because you always think it's just like, you know, it's just a fiction. You're just saying it to be nice to people to make them feel better. And then you discover that they're seriously putting rapists in women's jails. Yeah. And you're like, oh, you really mean it. And I have said to people things like, um, but you know, if men can be women, then we will end up with rapists in women's jails. And I genuinely thought that that would be them going, huh, that didn't occur to me. I've literally never had that reaction. What I get is you're saying all trans women are rapists, you're a bigot, or, well, we will risk assess case by case, or, um, but trans women are women and women can be rapists too, which is actually not true in UK law. Uh -huh. in UK law, it's only rape, if, you can only call it rape if there's a penis. Uh -huh. And it's it's um, aggravated sexual assault. You know, women can commit aggregate, aggravated sexual right. assault. But do you know what, Bridget? They mostly don't. Right. So, I know, statistically. You know, they, oh, so, so, like... Everything that I thought would wake people up, they're rapists in women's jails, they're sterilizing gay kids, you know, uh, they're letting men win women's sporting prizes. And by the way, it's obvious why we have women's sports. You know, right. use your brain, people. Um, none of it does. So at this point, I don't think that even women are being punched on the street. Like there have been women punched on the streets. We've right. got video of it and it's not waking people up. I mean, did you see some of the things that some of the nastiest misogynists in Britain said about that video of me smiling? I, like Billy Bragg, who's this ridiculous 1980s singer, never liked, I mean, I never listened to him. I don't think I ever listened to even decide whether I liked him or disliked him. Anyway, he's a massive trans rights bullshitter. Uh -huh. And he said, oh, well, they're smiling, you know, and now they're saying that they didn't like it, but look at them, they're smiling. And you're like, Ew. God. Like, yeah. it's so rapey, just so yeah. rapey. <laughs> it really is. <sighs> it's so weird because I'm like, I don't want some guy in 
sleepaway camp with my daughter in the in the bunks when she's 12 and I think about when I was in rehab which I was 19 and I was assaulted in my first rehab so then I specifically look for an all women's I was like, all right, I'm trying to get sober. I've already been assaulted. I was assaulted again in my rehab. I would like an all women's, um, it was like a halfway house at the time. Now they're called sober livings, but it was this halfway house and it was state funded. So it was many women who were on probation, avoiding jail, had been in and out of the system. And It was even there, there was still some, you know, lesbian kind of bullying that occurred in the same way that it might in a female prison. But I cannot imagine, imagine if there had been men there. There's no way. I just cannot imagine. I can't imagine. I was so broken by the time I got to that place. There, It was all all run by lesbians. Yeah. We know that women can't recover except in single-sex spaces from these sorts of things. Mm. I mean, we know that a woman who has been sexually assaulted needs a female-only place to recover. But also with the addiction thing, like, sorry, you know so much more about it than me, but because I've been doing this research on women's centres, you know, I'm going to tell you things you already know. (laughs) Sorry. I might not know Um, them, though. Well, so I was talking to a guy who, um, he now works for a a charity that does women's centres, but it also does rehab um, for men as well. And he said that in the 1990s and the 2000s, um, the the rehab centres in the UK, like they looked at the outcomes and they realised that, like, I mean, the, the ones he's talking about are the ones where you have to be sober. Like, yeah. if you if you use, you're out. Like, it's it's a last chance saloon type thing. Like, yeah. you agree to stay entirely off, whatever it is. And um, he said that the women who left generally left with a man that they had met in rehab right. and went together. And so they they had the sort of idea of and this what this wasn't even anything to do with safety or recovery or anything it was just that that's the way it worked for the women they would leave with a man and he said that often you know they'd be drunk by the time they'd got to the train station mm-hmm. like it was just immediate um so they tried having the women separate and the results were so much better like the outcomes were just much 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 yep. better the women finished their mandated or agreed period in rehab and when they checked up a year later they were still sober so even just on that pragmatic grounds, we know that women need women only rehab. Mm-hmm. My husband and, talks and here about we this. Are, yeah, you know? yeah. My husband's a therapist, and he talks about this a lot. Just how they show. Um, he was working with teenage girls, and they started doing the weird thing where they would add the they them's and the men to the groups, and he was like, "It totally changes the dynamic," and it's so frustrating because there's lots. He's like, it's just frustrating because there's so much evidence that they've done these studies that there are better outcomes for teenage girls recovering from eating disorders, from anything when they're just around other girls. And so it's the same with young girls as well. And now it just he's like, it just changes the whole dynamic and it's it's amazing how we've forgotten all the things that we know like there's an awful lot of um, institutional stupidity like deliberate um you know unknowing unseeing it's the whole you know three not very wise monkeys thing of just refusing to see what's in front of you so I was talking to um, another writer I know it's nothing to do she just she doesn't write trans stuff and um, but you know she knows what I wrote and she's sympathetic and she told me that her husband is a retired psychiatric nurse who used to work in closed wards. So there's people who have great difficulties, you know, people with very serious oh, mental yeah. illnesses. And, mm. and these are difficult places. Yes. And he always says to her that when he was training, one of the things they say to you in training over and over again is do not validate the delusion because you will lose control of the ward. And mm. that becomes built into your head. Because sometimes it's going to be really difficult. You're going to be on a very hard day. People are acting up big time. Maybe you're a bit understaffed because somebody's ill or something. And it's going to be so tempting to validate the delusion to just get someone to sit down and be quiet. But if you do that, you've built, you've stored up a huge problem for the future. And very quickly, you will lose control of the ward because you've validated the delusion. (laughs) It's like our society right now. (laughs) Exactly. I, 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 I mean, she put this in a WhatsApp chat with me. 
And I'm sending it to everybody I know in different WhatsApp chats. Guess what? I've just heard this brilliant expression. Do not validate the delusion or you will lose control of the ward. We've lost control of the ward, people. That's going to be the title of this episode. We have lost control of the ward. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Jesus, it's a great description of it. It is. I mean, Rogan says this all the time on his podcast. He's always talking about like how it's like the the we are all in an asylum and the mental patients have kind of taken over. Imagine the very, very, very first time a man said, uh, I am really a woman and I wished you to let me into the women's changing room and women's sports. If everybody had said, you are fucking kidding me, sod off. Yeah which is obviously the right answer. It was so sneaky, And we had just never started this bullshit, you know? It was just so And instead they're like, well, you know, this might make him feel better. I don't care. Like, I want him to feel better, of course. I'm not a mean person. A, I don't think it does make him feel better. But B, I don't want him to feel better at the cost of breaking everything. Yeah. What has been the kind of hardest part for you in all of this? Do you, you know, the this is a lot about just resilience and this podcast in general. And what is, what has been the, the challenge that you face, I think, in, in facing a lot of the, this, I mean, sometimes there are days where it just feels. Yeah. Very disheartening. I don't feel like that, but I mean, I should say that I'm an insanely cheerful person. Yeah. I have no reason for it. I'm just somebody who wakes up in a good mood every day. So like, lucky yeah. me. Um, and so that helps. But I mean, the big, the, the big challenge and the thing that bothers me if I let myself really look at it is how much faith I used to have in the institutions of our society. Like, you know, I didn't think everybody was perfect, but I thought the point of institutions was that imperfect people did an okay job and that things could get better. So now I don't trust any institutions anymore because like every institution is t- has a lie at its heart. And that lie is that men can be women and women can be men. And that breaks everything. So every institution has been co-opted. And then, you know, within those institutions, there are many people who know what's happened. So the second very depressing thing is, and I don't want to use the word cowardly because you know, loads and loads of people aren't cowards at all, but the position that they're in makes it impossible for them to speak. Yes. But a lot of people could do more than they are doing, or they're in a position where it would be inconvenient, but not life-changing to speak, Mm -hmm. and they don't. So if I let myself look directly at the unbelievable, colossal destruction of human value of our institutions and at people being so, so much less brave and so much less committed to the truth than I thought they were five years ago. That's genuinely depressing. But then, you know, I just think maybe I was living in a fool's paradise. Yeah, and that's, I mean, what, that's kind of where like I've that. come. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so that's but hard. Then- then you see this kind of rise of conspiratorial thinking yeah. and it's replacing the liberal values and now anything that's a conspiracy is truth. So you have- Yes, uh, exactly. That's, and that seems very disheartening to me too because those people will send you that meme like same as it ever was, you know, and there is a part of me that was I just delusional? Has it always been this way? And then I don't know that I want to go down some rabbit hill, rabbit hole where I'm like, I'm in the matrix, you know, just like whatever. Yeah, no, I, I, don't, I know, I know. I think <laughs> human beings are very prone to looking at big things that happen, like the pandemic or this bizarre ideology that suddenly seems like it's everywhere, and and to think that there's some shadowy force behind it, like. You know, in our own lives, if something big happens in your own life, there's probably a person behind it, actually. Yeah. You know, like, you know, if this, if something changes hugely in your own house, well, someone moved it is why. You know what I mean? Right. So you could think, oh, well, if I look around society and there's this huge change, there has to be like, you know, a oh, big conspiracy theory behind it, or, you know, it's China or it's Russia, or right. you know, if you're that sort of person, it's the Jews, isn't it? So right. those things are all false. Big things that we see in society often have many causes and those causes are sometimes just benign or harmless, but the thing is that they make a perfect storm. 
mm-hmm. and all these things come together and you know like or there's just like really bad luck like with the pandemic like this is the breakthrough disease and it you know and you have to hold back and stop yourself from having that that instinct of oh wow there has to be a shadowy force behind it there really doesn't right i mean we've had you know the first world war did not have a shadowy force behind it and it started over a silly little argument but i mean the, you know the stage was set for it but it could easily not have happened you know right. bad luck was a huge part of it and i'm not a religious person at all so i have to look at the rise of the big world religions and say that was chance that it was that little you know millenarian cult 2000 years ago that grew into a world religion another one you know thousands of others died and that one grew it's chance but yes you have to you have to hold yourself against that temptation to think this is big therefore there must be a big shadowy reason for it but i mean the point is that our institutions are meant to be the thing that imperfectly but better than anything else we've ever come up against or come up with protects us against that like the reason that we vote the reason that we have a democracy the reason that it's not just a pure democracy it's an institutional democracy you know that's moderated by congress by the courts um you know by the civil service all of those things is because these things kind of keep us going in the right direction and they stop us from going off track too much and when we go off track we realize it and we bring it back and we course correct and broadly speaking things get better we get wealthier and so on and we've broken that we've broken all these institutions so that really is scary yeah that's that's it's interesting because i just talked to do you know who walter kern is He's, I don't know. He's a writer and a brilliant mind, but he's like, you know, I think all of this, like, oh, we live in a simulation is basically lazy. You know, he's like, they, oh, yeah, you yeah, can yeah, yeah. point to individuals who are making these decisions and we should hold them accountable instead of being like, oh, it's the matrix or, oh, it's like the simulation that we're living in. Um, yeah, it's made- lazy. And it's also <laughs> a way of saying, I don't have to do anything. This isn't on yeah. me. Like I get that all the time. People email me from other countries and they say, oh, you know, I, you know, you're in the UK and I see great work that you're doing there. Like here in Canada or here in Australia, this is what's happening. You know, can you fix this? I yeah. mean, there's one I really resented <laughs> and I must say I sent a snitty reply to her. She <laughs> said, um, I think she was in Australia. And I mean, this is not fair of me, you know, but honestly, you, you'll understand why. Um, she said she had a whole load of documents about an organization there that's the equivalent of Stonewall for us, which is the equivalent, I guess, of HRC for you. And she said, um, you know, I can really show all the work they're doing. And you know, I need someone to put this into the public and we don't have anyone like you here. I've set up a burner email that's nothing to do with my name just to send this to you because I'm too scared to put, even put my name to this. You're like, I, I'm one woman in a different country. Yeah. And if you're too scared even to email me in your own name, well, then I'm afraid you're not going to help. Yeah. Like somebody has to stand up. If nobody stands up, then there's nobody standing up. So I tried, you know, I, I tried not to be too rude, but I did reply to her and I said, well, you know, you said there's no Helen Joyce or Maya Forstadt or J.K. Rowling here in Australia. And I'm like, well, none of us were what we are until we stood up. Right. So, you know, if you can't stand up, well, then you're not helping to fix it. Maybe you can't stand up. I don't know her situation. Um, but if nobody stands up, then, you know, you're lost. So think about that. I saw a clip of you. I think it was with Richard Dawkins. Maybe I, it was going around and you were talking about why you worry that this is actually not getting better because so many of the people who are behind a lot of these bills and laws that are being passed have trans kids themselves. That was with Peter Boghossian. Okay. That's right. That was with Peter. Um, that really stuck out to me coming. I'm in Texas now, but coming from California, there was that AB 957 bill that Gavin just knew some, the governor just vetoed, which is good. I'm glad he did. Yeah. Even if I think it might be for cynical political reasons, like he wants to run in a general election. Still glad he did it. Shocking that it made it all the way, but not really when you looked at it, Scott Weiner, who's, I don't know. I never want to see that guy's hard drive. Um, He's just put some of the most ridiculous bills you've ever heard through, and he's been d- very destructive to the state. And the woman who spoke, I cannot remember her name for the life of me at this moment, but it turns out she has a trans child. And I was like, always, always it ha- happens. And I thought your point was so good on Peter's um, podcast. 
and I'll let you articulate it because you're better at this than me and I don't want to misquote you. So I, I actually don't remember what I was saying directly before it was Peter, but the bit that got clipped, it's explaining that there is a group of people who have bought into this ideology in a way that's completely irreversible and it's worse than doing it to yourself. It's the, it's the parents who have responded to a child's declaration of a trans identity. Like this is a fork in the road moment if a child says to you, I'm really a boy or I'm really a girl because you can, you know you want to try and hold everything open and that's actually the best advice I can give if that happens to you is to try to just keep delaying things and hope that something resolves but basically at some point you're going to have to decide um there's a particular person here in the UK who was in this situation and I know he talked to me and to some other people who don't think that you should transition children and he also talked to the other side but the thing is you can't talk to both sides forever because right. I'm saying those people over there, they're telling you to do something that is a human rights abuse, like a grotesque mm. human rights abuse. They're telling you a lie. They're telling you to tell your child to live a lie and that lie will harm them for the rest of their lives. Maybe make them sterile if they go through all of that uh, treatment, you know, damage their brains if they take puberty blockers, damage their bones. You know, the worst thing you could do to your child, harm them irrevocably. But they're saying, if you listen to her, your child will probably kill themselves. Your child is really trans. That's who they are. They will hate you. They will cut you off. You know, you are going to have to decide. I'm really sorry for anyone in that situation. But if you decide the trans route, you're all in. You have to now believe for the rest of your life that what you did was the right thing. Because if you didn't, you have done something terrible and you've done it to your child. And there's no way back. There's, it's not just the medical thing. There's no way back from. There's no way. We, we can't actually turn back time. We can't give children back an experience that we've denied them. Mm. So if you deny them puberty or, you know, normal development along with their peers, that can never be fixed. So you are now going to be the biggest cheerleader for this movement, not just now, but for decades to come. Mm. And the more of those people they are, there are, the harder it is for us to fight back on this. Well, I think this was this interview was a few months ago, I think now, and that clip has been circulating. It's probably one of the most influential things I've ever seen. But a couple of weeks ago, somebody I'd never heard of, a journalist here, I won't say the name because I don't like pylons, just randomly retweeted this saying, what an extraordinarily cruel and heartless and hateful woman or something like that. <laughs> it was like, thanks. And underneath people are, you know, saying all sorts and then like someone I know just messaged me and said trans child uh, yeah a, yeah, yeah. Always. I mean one of my friends said she actually had to sit on her hands to stop herself from commenting underneath truth hurts yeah and then people got a bit nasty to him you know I mean I didn't reply I just haven't commented on this at all I'm not entering into this conversation yeah um now he started it and you hear the words he called me right so then somebody found an article he had written, I haven't read it and I'm not going to, about when his father was ill. And I think it was probably quite a touching article. And somebody said something mean about that. Like, I don't even remember what, like they were commenting on, you know, you said this about your father. I don't think that you were real about that or whatever. And he replies saying, you're so horrible. Why would you do that? Why would you be so personal to somebody you don't even know? Like, excuse me. Yeah. Over here, drive by bloody shooting. <laughs> yeah. I just you no self-awareness but, but the thing is to him I do feel cruel and heartless I understand yeah. yeah like what I am saying is you have done a dreadful dreadful thing to your child and I don't want to say that to him yeah I'm sorry for him he was put in a very difficult position the fact is he has done a terrible thing to his child and they were lied to so often they were lied to oh, by yeah, yeah, institutions yeah, yeah, yeah. and doctors and psychiatrists and therapists oh, oh God. And I mean I'm Completely, completely. I'm so glad that I did not have to live through any of this. I'm so grateful. I'm sorry every day for these parents. It's the worst thing. It's it's really bad, whatever they do, honestly. Um, but I can't not say it. Like, yeah. this, this, this is why it casts a spell over institutions. Like, it's really hard to say to somebody, God, you did a dreadful thing to your child, didn't you? Like, that's a really taboo thing to say. <laughs> and obviously it goes down very badly if you do say it. But the fact is that the promise they've made to their child is a promise that isn't up to them to deliver on. It's for everybody else to deliver. What they've said to their child is, you can call yourself a boy or you can call yourself a girl and the rest of society will accept that. And I'm here saying the rest of society will not accept that. If this is a boy we're talking about and you tell him he can be a girl, 
He's not going to come into the girls' changing rooms because I'm going to fight tooth and nail to stop it. I'm going to get him out of women's sports. I'm not going to call him she, her because I don't do that anymore. I don't do that politeness thing anymore because when I do that, I'm not able to articulate my rights. I know. I cannot look at a boy and say, I'll call you she, her out of politeness and a girl and then explain why you can't come into the changing rooms or why you can't come into the sports. I've seen. So, so I have to do all of those things. And now I'm the one who makes the parents a liar. Right. But they shouldn't ever have made a promise like that. They should never have promised how I would behave. Right. That's so, that's so true. I, I, I've noticed even in my own writing and, and having to tackle this topic about the rights of women and seeing it with many women who are kind of willing to be polite and use she, her, and I resent every time now I write a piece about this, I'll just say male and my editor always inserts biological. And I'm like, mm. it's redundant. There's no other sort. There's <laughs> yeah. no other sort of male. You are, I mean, with sex, I, I understand it because sex could be sexual intercourse. <clears throat> so they're just right. disambiguating. But there's no other sort of male. Like there isn't a sort of a, you know, a psychological male. That's the idiotic idea that, you know, we have sexed souls and they float around the place and sometimes end up in the wrong body. Yeah. I, I resent this it so stupid. much. I'm like, and I always push back and it's like, oh, it's just for clarity. I'm like, because you've already accepted their premise that trans men are men, you know, that I need to make yeah. this dis- yeah. distinction. So I'm saying I reject this well, premise. Born male, you know? Yeah. yeah I love the male. idea that like, it's like an assignment, like, like a seat, next, you know? like you pick it on a flight. You're like, oh, here's your assign, your assignment. It's like a, it's so, that word is so specific. Like you yeah, get you're assigned. Being upgraded, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, here's your flight upgrade. You need some extra leg room because oh. you're actually a man. Oh, but some- <laughs> <laughs> so, somebody, I had such fun a while ago. So it's really great fun when you're able to get yourself into a position where you're able to talk about these things in language that they don't approve of and they can't stop you. So I was at this lunch that was talking about the idiotic fact that from this year, um, when you apply for university here, there's a standardized form. It's called UCAS, Universities and Colleges Application Scheme. And you apply for all of them through this one form. Like the applications go to the different universities. But anyway, so UCAS has made the idiotic decision to ask you what your self-identified gender is instead of your sex when you apply. And so you can say male, female, and then they say that those are like whatever you identify as, or I think there's an, you know, non-binary and other or something like that. But anyway, they've belatedly realized that this actually isn't lawful in the UK. I won't go into the reasons, but it's too late to fix it this year or next. And so they're trying to work out what to do. So they had this, this lunch anyway to talk about this. And, um, you know, they, they gave us this thing about um, how, uh, you know, it's very important to feel seen at the point of university entry. And I mean, I looked around the table and there were three middle-aged women at this table and every single one of us like had that sort of (laughs) expression on our faces. Like every one of us has teenage kids or similar age, like going like, they do not need to feel seen at the point of university entry. They just need to get their marks and do their university application, you know? Anyway, so this sort of bollocks they were talking. And then, um, you know, I was saying how important it was that they had sex aggre- disaggregated data in order that they could track uh, trends. And a little devil got into me and I said, you know, particularly for the non-binary students, it's really important to know what's different between the non-binary boys and the non-binary girls. <laughs> and, you know, like how trends change. Like, are the non-binary girls doing what girls do and the non-binary boys doing what boys do? And you could see their faces. They're going like, I know she's speaking heresy, but I don't know what to say because that's actually quite a good point. Yeah. I loved it. It was brilliant. <laughs> I love saying to people, is that a non-binary boy or a non-binary girl? <laughs> It's just like, I think I, this has been an inspiring conversation for me only because I think I have to r- recognize that I'm, and maybe that's why I've been feeling, I I came out of it. It was like a week where I was just felt like so overwhelmed. I'd been interviewing all these people and writing about this and thinking about it and then seeing like this discussion and the culture on the right of like body count. And, and I was like, Oh God, oh, it's it is my stand up bit. I have a whole stand up bit. I've been doing it on dumpster fire, my show for years saying patriarchy. So crafty. I'm like, I didn't believe in the patriarchy until they started taking over women's sports. And now I'm like, maybe those feminists were right. <laughs> like, maybe, 
<laughs> Maybe everything yeah, is no, patriarchy. Absolutely. <laughs> patriarchy so crafty. They'll turn themselves into women so they can stay back on top. I, it's like, I don't know. There's no other explanation other than mediocre you know men something? needed to you get back just, on top. You have, just stated, you have just stated the really meaningful and actually correct thing the one and only correct thing at the heart of queer theory. So obviously queer theory is this bollocks that they talk on campus where everything is the opposite and there are no boundaries and anything identifies as anything and it's bad to have categories. But if you talk to somebody who's actually a profound thinker about queer theory, and I did this a while ago, and what she explained to me is that one of the insights of queer theory is that power outs. So you do something like, um, uh, you know, black liberation or um, women's rights or something. And it, it makes a difference. It does make a difference. It makes things better. And then power outs and it takes over whatever it is you've just done. And it does this reversal and it goes seamlessly on. And the way it does that is by co-opting the ideas and the institutions. And so when you look at pride marches now, you see the proof that this bit of queer theory is correct. Because they, you know, there was a brief moment that they were liberatory, that they were gay people coming out and saying, I'm not ashamed. You know, I'm not ashamed to be gay and I'm here and I'm queer and whatever the other slogans were. And now you look and it's these absolutely disgusting kingster straight men, you know, urinating on each other, having public sex, you know, dressing up as dogs, marching around the place. Like, you know, it's male sexual license on steroids mm. performed in public in front of women, in front of children, and nobody can say a damn thing. It's a patriarchal reversal. It's a queer theory reversal. So, yeah, uh. that's how it works. Power <laughs> structures kind of take over again whenever you try to, whenever you get a um, a bit of a fight back against them. Yeah, I always I always joke on, on Dumpster Fire, which is probably why we're throttled by youtube about how it's just like mediocre men were feeling feeling like they were getting like women have done well you know we're getting more educated we're more actually men are not in a great place right now if you look statistically they're struggling they're not getting as in america at least they're more deaths of despair there's um they're not getting educated as much as women. They're not even making as much money as women uh, oftentimes. And I, I think that, you know, it's an easy way to, to get back on top. <laughs> I want to, I want to tell you one more story that I think really, me, I know. You know, really shows this, <laughs> this patriarchal reversal thing. So just today on Twitter, I was looking at the, um, somebody tweeted a bunch of pictures from Folsom street pride Mm. And I mean, you know, they're disgusting. They're just like literally men pissing on each other and things. I've been but there. But one of them was this picture. Yeah. Well, this one was a picture of a middle-aged man dressed up um, in a dog collar, like dressed as a, you know, a clergyman. And he had a paddle, like for beating people, um, attached to his belt. And a collar around the neck of a girl who, I mean, I'm sure she was older than 18, but she looked very, very young. And she, um, she was topless um, and she'd had her breasts removed and she was wearing boxer shorts. And on her chest, she had um, a, a reference to a biblical um, chapter, like a, bi a biblical verse, something from Deuteronomy. And if you look it up, it's the one about taking a wife as a slave. Oh, Jesus. And so here we are, we have a man with an instrument that's for beating a woman, um, dressed up as a religious character, a topless woman with a collar, wearing the thing that says she's a slave. And that's what's parading along the street. Is it end times? Of pride. <laughs> Is it end times? Don't you wonder? No, not if we fight back. Look, we can't be despairing about this. No, I mean, I'm, we have I'm to be not. I see, so many, I see so many people who are fighting back. And I mean, Canada, who I really thought was lost, and we've been joking as lost, really was very surprising to me to see. I see it with parents everywhere. Just even the way people talk to one another personally in the in the parent groups and seeing homeschools and you know, there people are kind of there's definitely a, I think a a reaction to all of this that is appropriate and long and overdue. You know, yeah, yeah, heartening and bottom up. No, I think we've got to be Churchill about it. We will fight them on the beaches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I also think like, you know, what do you want to like, I mean, I'm not Jewish, but a, a friend of mine who's also not Jewish, we're very good friends with uh, an Orthodox rabbi. And my friend was telling me she went to one of the celebrations in the last week or two. And you, um, you think about what you want said on your name and the book of life. 
And, you know, it's an interesting question. What do you want recorded as being the thing that you achieved? And when I was being all sanctimonious and self-regarding, when I was thinking about, you know, yes, I need to write this book because I've stumbled upon this story. Like, you can feel it's too much and it's also terrible. And I thought, look, they're sterilizing gay kids. I can't stop them, but it's possible that I can make the number lower than it would be if I didn't write the book. Right. And I think that's true. So, so that, like, if that got written on my gravestone or, you know, as my entry in the book of life, that's fine. That's good. So I just think we have to think about it that way. Like this crazy thing is happening. I can't stop it. Um, but I'm not going to sit down without a fight and maybe I can limit the harm. Yeah. And then, and then, and then you stop worrying. You're facing the right direction. You know what you've got to do each morning. Yes. What is your biggest uh, defect of character? <laughs> oh, God, I have so many. I mean, I think, honestly, my worst is I hold horrific grudges. Uh, <laughs> so I, I am, it's, it's a is very that unattractive character trait. Is this, I just I, like it hugely. I joke about this all the time because I'm Irish and I'm like, I swear to God, when somebody does something, it is like a tiny mafia awakens in my heart and is like, you're dead to me. It's like, oh, I feel like that. <laughs> is that an my Irish husband thing? calls it my little book of grudges. Like, I, 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 I mean, I just, I'm sounding off about someone or I'm saying, this, 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 you know, bitch, 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 bitch. And he says, have you written that one in your book of grudges? <laughs> Oh, that's really funny. <laughs> oh, God. And I try not to be like this. I really, I really, know. really try because it's not helpful. But then sometimes somebody, you know, really, really pisses me off. And I just like, that person is dead to me. And I, you know, I decide, okay, I'm not going to say anything publicly because, you know, I have to rise above it or whatever. <laughs> and then like over the next sort of year or two, like this happened like literally last weekend, I was sitting next to someone I hadn't met before. And they know somebody who is like number one in my list of grudges. And this guy suddenly said, do you know this person? Half an hour I spent listing every single reason I couldn't stand this person <laughs> and what they had done to me. And, and at some point I'm like, he's not even interested anymore. He's, he's trying to get away from me. He just can't get out of the table <laughs> going on about this horrible person. And then I was like, and then he did this thing to me and then he did that thing. And, and by the way, he did the other. Like, this is bad. bad. So there you go. That's a genuine character. To oh, Helen, I, I have that uncomfortable feeling in my stomach when you relate so hard to somebody, <laughs> like when they're saying something that's like, uh this is this is like one of my ugliest defects of character. It really is like the yeah. I mean, I wanted to say to you, I just work too hard. I'm yeah. just too passionate. Or something. No, no, I'm the no, same I way. Hold a bad grudge, and it's like really, it's insidious sometimes because I like you will try to rise above it, but then I'll just start destroying their life from behind closed doors. You know, like I really, like I, a, I really try not to. I really, I know. really try not to. The thing is, like. I have so many enemies now who I, they're not people I have a grudge against. They're people yeah. that, you know, I've literally never personally interacted with, but they're people who are destroying the world, that they're people who, you know, are running charities and NGOs and things that are destroying the world. So, you know, all my ire is focused on them. But the fact is that I have this petty little list of grievances uh, of people who I feel, you know, did done me wrong. Uh, and I, I mean, I, what I do is, and, and, and maybe this is a good way to deal with it is I make a joke of it. So, you know, some of my closest friends know about this joke about my little book of grudges. And so, you know, I'll say something like, you know, such and such, like somebody who's on, there's probably only about six people I feel like this about. And, and then we just all laugh and I say, you know, except for that person yeah. or, you know, like That's this story about it. going on and on about this bloke. Yeah. So, yeah, I cope by laughing at myself. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, oof. I mean, that is that is one of the things that is very heartening is seeing the Irish women um, because I feel like Ireland is a little bit lost. I don't know. It seems like. Oh, it is. It really is. It's awful. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's just got this really out of touch governing class. Mm. I mean, I don't know that it used to be like this. Like when I was a child and in my early 20s and in my 30s, like Irish politicians were kind of shyster used car salesmen, farmer types mostly, like smooth talking, you know, would sell their granny for a vote types. <laughs> I mean, typ typical small country, you know, you've got to scrape for every vote type politicians. I'm not saying these were admirable people, not at all. Right. But they they were very down to earth. They were very embedded in their communities. You know, the sort of people who went to every funeral. Yes. Um, you know, because that's where you meet people and get votes. 
Yeah. And now we've got this weird internationalized kind of like the, people call them the D2 set. Like D2 is the Dublin 2 postcode. It's where the expensive, nice houses are. It's where you mm. live if you're a politician, if you work for RTE, which is our equivalent of BBC, like the national broadcaster. You know, if you and, and those people are like, I suppose they're, I suppose it's part of globalization, isn't it? That there's this out of touch group who feel it's their right to run countries and who who have great contempt for the people actually living in those countries yeah so Irish people are very small c conservative like we don't like whatever mad fad they're going with in England and we've often not picked up the latest mad fad like we let them do the stupid you know whole word reading methodology and we just never did it right <laughs> um, but now we've got this group bloody foisting crap on us like gender self-id and now this absolutely Orwellian uh, hate speech law that they're trying to foist on us and you know just try I don't know they just don't like Ireland they think that we should be you know nowhere country this this deracinated perfect in their mind um you know properly you know trans inclusive nowhere place and, and when you talk to ordinary people, they think, like, nobody represents me. I don't read what I think in the Irish Times. I don't really see what I think on RTE. You know, my politicians are not representing me. And that's dangerous. That's really dangerous for democracy. Yeah, that does. That That is the sense I have. It seems... Uh, yeah, like glo- like you said, globalization. What What is your biggest, I mean, we could have a whole other podcast about this, but I'll ask you what your biggest asset is. Oh God, what's my biggest asset? I mean, if if I can say two, because one of them I've said already, which is I'm an extremely cheerful person. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, things just don't get me down. I wake up in a good mood and I stay in a good mood. And, um, you know, when you're doing something that really is upsetting, but what I would have to say is my family. Uh, so especially like I've always thought that I'm a very family oriented person. I have eight siblings. My parents are great. There's 21 kids of the next generation because, you know, we've all had kids. I have just two of the best boys in the world. My husband's great. But when I see the people who have been torn apart by this ideology, it's when it's inside the house and it's not inside my house. You know, my family is fine. They're doing great. My boys are doing great. My marriage is strong. And and that means that I can go out and I can, you know, face the madness every day because at home it's not mad. And, you know, I'm really, really sorry for anyone who hasn't got, you know, a sane, safe home. Yeah, that's such a good point. It's so true. I get so much strength from the stability here in my home too, to be able to face the I mean, I just got a pile on over the weekend that was kind of wild. I didn't really know it was happening. But then somebody was sending me screenshots of me being like, you know, the right has a woman problem. And then it was like, repeal the 19th, repeal the Jews. I was like, whoa, this is just bananas. (laughs) Now I know why people were texting me to see if I was okay. I didn't see it. But it's such a... It's such a wild, I I was just with my family, you know, just making food and, and having loving times. So I think that that is, that is the strongest asset one can have. You're right. Where can we find you? Do you have another book coming? I'm meant to be writing another book. My agent and my editor are getting more than uh, impatient with me, but um, this book has had a long shelf life and a long tail. I'm probably talking about it more than I was when it came out. And, you know, it's not like the subject has gone away. I don't want to write something else about trans issues because, you know, to blow my own trumpet for a bit, I really feel I said what needed to be said in that one book. I think it's a complete book in itself. Um, But I also, I think I now have some insight into other um, cultural issues that are uh, really tearing us apart. And I'm trying to decide which of those, like I have a few ideas and I keep driving the people who want me to write another book mad by circulating between them. But I mean, I'm just very busy. Yeah. Yeah. I've got to try, you know, I mean, the economist was a very well paid job by comparison with what I'm doing now. So there's also the business of trying to, you know, hustle to get some income, you know, from various sources and that takes time as well. Well, Um, yes. So that was a long way of saying, you know, yes, I'm meant to be writing another book and I have some ideas, but don't hold your breath. Yeah, I hope people are buying your book, though. I think it's such a good Oh, yeah, it's keeping selling explainer. well. It's really keeping selling well. 
I wish it got picked up. Um, I mean, it was never issued uh, in an American edition. Um, oh. no, like it was, it, no, I know it was offered to American publishers. And I mean, they basically either like said Regnery? that. Um, well, the thing is that people like Regnery, um, like because America is so big and so culturally dominant, American publishers tend to want an American version of everything. Right. So, so the people who liked it said, this is great, but we want an American treatment. And that was very irritating because I really especially tried to make it very international. Like, you know, I did a chapter from Canada. I did a, yeah. you know, I did a chapter from America. I, I chose different countries for different bits of it. And of course, it is an international story. But I mean, my publisher said, like, that's the way it goes. It's still unusual that it wouldn't get picked up as an American edition because, I mean, it went straight into the top 10 here in the UK uh, in its first week. Um, that is strange. And books like that really routinely do get picked up. Um but I mean, it's been distributed. It's not that you can't get it. Um, Simon and Schuster kindly distributed uh, it in the States, and I'm grateful for that. But it's not an American edition, and there's nobody in America who is trying to publish, pub publicize it. Like, there's no one who's bought the rights to it in America. I mean, I don't know if that ever happens two years after a book comes out, but that's frustrating because, like, uh -huh. since then, I've been on Jordan Peterson twice, and, you know, I'm, I mean, not on any other very big podcast. Joe Rogan, please. And, um, <laughs> Joe would, I'm you surprised know, you haven't been on there yet. He would love you. Oh, well, I mean, it's not like I haven't emailed him saying please. So if you know him, let him know, you know. <laughs> I've been on Megan um, Kelly now, which was great. Like, I really oh, I admire that. her. Yeah. And yeah, she, she's great. Like, she's she's peaked big and hard on this. Yeah. Very, I mean, I actually thought a lot of her anyway. Like, I've always thought she's a very brave journalist. Um, But yeah, so, like, it's got this long tail life and... The problem isn't going away and, you know, I'm now a campaigner on the topic. So that just takes up a lot of my time. Yeah. Well, I look for you are welcome on this podcast anytime. I look forward to your insights on all things and I'm always following your work and I'm following you online and Thank you. just love you. So I'll give you my um, I'll give you the the link to my own newsletter for the show notes. So it's the Helen Joyce.com. OK. And I tweet I tweet far too much. So if anyone wants to follow me on Twitter, I'm pretty active there. You and me both. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, thank you so much. Lovely to talk Love to, to you, to Bridget. Meet you. Thank you. It's time for the weekly check in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. What should we talk about? My 10 year sober anniversary. Yes. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Congratulations. That's, I just remember talking to you in the early days when you're like, I just can't wait till I have like five years sober. <laughs> I mean, a decade when you get sober is like, I always say it's just like science fiction. You're just like, that's not real. You're lying. You don't even believe that people did manage to make it that long. Yeah. And it's so crazy because a decade is a long time. A long time. It's a fourth of my life. I can't believe you've been sober for a decade. I can't believe it's been 10 years. And it's still only half the amount of time that I was drinking. <laughs> I've got another 10 years to go. How does yeah. it feel? What are your Good. feelings? It's like emotional. I feel very grateful because I just look around and everything is, you know, I, I'm caught a lot in like it never being enough just because I'm always so busy and I feel like I'm chasing so many things and trying to do so many things. But when something like this happens and I can slow down and look around and just it's wild it's just wild like how much my life has changed how much everything in my life should be labeled property of AA that is annoyingly true and how I do feel like a little bit I feel like a little squirrely not like I want to drink or use just like I've been it's the discomfort of I think when I get in fear and I'm not going to meetings or I'm not really like plugged in here. Yeah. And I kind of unplugged in LA because of the, I was pretty plugged in in the early pandemic and then I just kind of drifted away and then had a baby, got busy, moved. So it's been kind of one cascading thing after another. And I was talking to a friend today who has like 13 years, actually Sarah Heppelow, who's author of Blackout, which when it came out, I read and was like, this is so it was like a crazy bestseller and she's awesome. And she was, she's definitely like, you know, I can, I can tell you that things get weird, particularly around a decade. If you're not 
going to meetings and I think I have to like dig back into the program right. as much as I'm like, Bleh. do you get like a, can, will you get like a 10 year chip? Do they have those? Yeah. Jaren gave me one. Oh, wow. And so did my sister. How did, how did they get them? You can get them online. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. They got me, they, I got one for my sister. She sent me one, a very sweet card. I was very thoughtful and Jaren gave me one last night, like a little after midnight that he got for me. Wow. And, yeah, it's they're cool. Yeah, it's just I don't know. I haven't really let it land. I probably should. That's why I wanted to go out tonight and do something to kind of celebrate a little bit. Yeah, and I don't know. It's it's hard to explain. It's just it's so normal, and yet drinking and smoking weed was so much of my life and personality and for so long. Yeah, that that was so normal too. It's just very, very weird. Yeah. I I feel like it's weird to being out of LA now to look back on that time in LA where you spent so long there sober, but I remember a long time with, of you there too, while you were still drinking, you know, yeah. like, cause we lived there so long together. It's like a good six years. Yeah. Yeah. It was a pretty significant chunk of it. Yeah. The fun chunk. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Those were some fun times, though. I mean, we were also, you know, in our 20s and early 30s at that point. Yeah, those were, I mean, that was It's fun. just partying, you know, in L.A. I was joking with my, I was on Nancy Rommelman and Sarah Heppel's podcast, which was so fun. And we talked about a lot of this stuff getting sober. And I was like, I was so hot. <laughs> free and I was talking about how I used to want to make that card I'm the freest person on this wall Uh huh. and now I'm one of the Christmas sweater people yep <laughs> with the with their little family Christmas cards in Texas uh-huh in suburbia places. at that point in my life I would have been like you're out of your mind you're out your damn mind I am not ever gonna be that person Texas Although weirdly, I even before I got sober, I was joking about moving to Austin. Remember, I used to be get drunk and be like, "I'm moving to Austin and I'm starting a band." <laughs> well, then there was also the "I'm gonna have babies" <laughs> rant. Yeah, that was a very hungover Bridget one day lying in that bed. That was my threat. Like, I'm gonna have babies. My idle threat of lots giving up on my life. Of babies. Yeah, no, it's it's it feels I'm just tired. I'm just baby woke up and I feel like I've been just I don't know, the news I hate it when it, I feel like the last time I was kind of this obsessed with the news was maybe Ukraine, but also probably more realistically like COVID when mm -hmm. I was really just I feel like it's existential. Mm -hmm. And it's draining. Yeah, well, I do hope you, you know, you go tonight and you let the moment land. I don't know. I'm let so it tired. sink in. I might go to bed. That might be my party. <laughs> well, at least, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be on the day, but do something to mark the time because it is, it's a huge, enormous accomplishment. And it really did change your life. Jaren and I just have so many birthdays and anniversaries. So we were just going to go out like one night and right. celebrate all of them because right. it's just the gauntlet. It's my anniversary. Then it's his. He has six years of sobriety. Then it's our marriage anniversary. We've been married three. Then it's my birthday. I'm f turning 45. Then it's his. Yep. His last year in his 40s. Wow. Mm -hmm. Nuts. Nuts. 45. Like, what? I don't know. Everything feels, even though it's only a year ago, nine years, 44, everything this year feels like 10 years, 45. They're big. I'm they're like, big oh, markers. God. Yeah. 45 is halfway to 50. And then you're like, 50? <laughs> I feel like an elderly person. I need <laughs> to sign up for my AARP card. <laughs> and you have a one-year-old. Yeah, and she keeps me young, but man, it's definitely a young person's game having kids. Yeah. You need that youthful energy, I think. Luckily, you and Darren both 
are very youthful and yeah, but we're have psycho, a lot of energy. So we don't know how to rest. That's true too. So we we spend we spend it like last night. We were like, ah, we can. We've got help in the morning. We can stay up late. And then she woke up at five, which she never does. And mm-hmm. I was like, fuck, mm-hmm. we're screwed. We've made a huge <laughs> mistake. So we're both going on like three hours of sleep, maybe four. And that's that's having a kid and the joys of it. Uh huh. And she's just such a cute little nugget. She really is. She's freaking adorable. But she's also too smart for her own good. Already. She's just going to be an interesting ride with that one. I know, because she's so strong-willed and stubborn. It's nuts. I wonder where she gets that from. (laughs) (laughs) Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)